Ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. It is 2 p.m. Eastern uh, on a Wednesday, and so you know what that means, folks. It is time for Luma's Work From Home webinar, and uh, I am uh, I'm very excited today uh, to have a very relevant, fascinating uh, topic uh, to touch base on, B2B software. Uh, I'll soon be handing uh, the microphone over to my uh, trusty partner, Brian Anderson, our B2B software expert, who will uh, be having a discussion with a gaggle of experts in B2B uh, software to sort of thoroughly uh, run through that issue. Now, for those of you joining regularly, you know that this Wednesdays at 2 p.m. has been uh, time for Luma's Work From Home webinar series. Um, we've covered a variety of topics from uh, in season one, from streaming, identity, comedy, industry consolidation, emerging trends, D2C brands, creative. We then were renewed, amazingly, for a season two where we tackled podcasting, uh, the Art of the Exit, Careers, Radical Candor, B2D Marketing, State of Mobile Apps, and now uh, B2B Software. So that's two full seasons of incredible content uh, in our Work From Home webinar series. However, I have news, folks. That's right. We have been canceled. Uh, I've always said this is the only show uh, where we want it to be canceled, but yep, our distribution contract was not renewed, and we this will be the last work from home webinar. But do not fear, folks, for we have started a new series, an interim series called we're calling Virtual Can Conversations to sort of continue the dialogue about trends and issues in the ecosystem with experts. Uh, and uh, stay tuned for more of those uh, announcements in the coming weeks through the month of June, and then we're gonna configure a whole new series. We just didn't wanna stay on that theme of work from home. It sort of sounded locked down and pandemic-ish, and we wanna get to things more sort of uplifting uh, uh, because we are coming back. Um, you know, it is, a, it is, a, it is a, hopefully the dawn of a new day. Uh, here in New York, we are uh, well into uh, or into the uh, recovery, and uh, we're hoping that if people stay smart about how we come back, that uh, we will start to uh, return to some level of normality, at least across uh, across some aspects of our business. So, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Brian Anderson to conduct this webinar on B2B software. Brian, take it away. All right, thank you. So excited to be here. We have. So the topic B2B software, it's really B2B marketing. So it's software and advertising. Um, and we have some true industry thought leaders. So we have Penry Price joining us from LinkedIn, who leads go to market for the marketing solutions business. Uh, Gabe Rogal, the CEO of Demandbase and John Miller, the CEO of Engageo until just a couple days ago, where um, you likely saw the news yesterday that Demandbase and Engageo have now joined. Um, so, before we get into those discussions, I uh, wanted to just kind of set the stage and talk about some of the industry trends that, that we see that we've been talking about. Also touch on um, some surveys about you know, the current market environment um, and COVID-19 impacts. And then we'll dive into you know, discussions with Penry, Gabe, and John. So for the industry trends, um, those of you that have seen you know, Luma presentations or uh, Terry and my webinar on privacy and data. Um, you know, we talk a lot about the digital media, you know, the advertising challenges with the really, the interrelated um, issues of privacy regulation and data restrictions. And those have created, you know, certain challenges really because of, of identity or, you know, the reduction in identifiers, you know, from, you know, these, uh, you know, the regulation and, and data restrictions. Um, and that's led to challenges, obviously, with one-to-one -one targeting in the open web, especially when Google Chrome deprecates the cookie, um, as well as measurement and other areas as well. But those are the two uh, that we've been highlighting. 
But where there's challenges, there's always opportunities. So first and foremost, I'd say first party data. We've been talking about um, how marketers, you know, with the shifting environment have realized, you know, first party data has always been extremely valuable, but it's really critical to make sure uh, that you, um, that you collect and, and utilize and activate your first party data. Logged in identities has always been the gold standard for identifiers, um, and the importance of those has only increased in this environment. And then from an advertising perspective, you've seen a you know, kind of renewed interest or resurgence in, in capabilities like contextual targeting, IP targeting, and then creative we view is gonna be more and more important in this, this uh, environment. So on the first point, um, uh, those who have seen my presentations know I spent a lot of time in the CDP area. And the reason for that is it's still the number one category from VC investment as well as market adoption. So as I mentioned, it's really to enable marketers to collect their data, normalize that data, create profiles, and then be able to um, you know, analyze that information and activate uh, that information. Most of the time we talk about this in the uh, construct of B2C marketing. And this graphic that we put together about a year ago, um, you can see is kind of uh, tailored for B2C um, e-commerce. But for B2B, it's really the same construct, same, same philosophies. It's just, you know, there's some changes in the types of data coming in, the apps that are being used for activation, and then importantly, the, the user profile really becomes a user and account profile in order to enable account-based marketing. So coming back to identity, you know, the right message, right time to the right person. Identity is what enables, you know, that right person aspect. And therefore, it's critically important for all aspects of marketing. Um, but identity isn't just a light switch. You have it or you don't have it. It's really a spectrum. Um, so it, you know, goes obviously from unknown all the way to knowing the person, um, definitively through logged in, but there's capabilities in between, you know, from probabilistic to deterministic methods, as well as capabilities like IP in order to enable, you know, company level information or household information. And then there's a spectrum of scale, you know, from many on one side to, uh, much less or a few on, on the other side. Um, for B2B marketing specifically, a lot of the comments um, made uh, so far, again, have been kind of general marketing. And since B2C marketing is the largest area of spend, really where those trends have, have been um, realized the most, B2B marketing actually is seeing the same things um, as far as the privacy regulation, identity measurement um, issues. A couple other uh, specific trends one is, you know, MarTech sales tech convergence that's been really uh, happening, you know, over the last five years or so is ABM um, has been um, more and more uh, adopted by marketers. The other one is MarTech and ad tech convergence, where we saw this on the B2C side, um, you know, probably almost a decade ago, especially as DMPs were being adopted, not as much on the B2B side, because B2B advertising was pretty nascent and small. But with the, the adoption of account-based marketing, advertising has been growing significantly, you know, with parties like the ones we have on the call today. And so we therefore have been seeing, you know, convergence MarTech and ad tech for B2B as well. And then the recent news, as of yesterday, as we just mentioned, you know, demand-based has acquired Engageo. And when Gabe and John took me through the rationale you know, for the acquisition and the plan going forward, um, I asked if I could use a few of their slides, which are these, these next few. Because if you look at this framework, it's very similar to what I just talked about with CDPs. There's a data layer, there's decisioning, and then there's the different delivery channels. You know, within each one of those, there's lots of different capabilities. But if you boil down the Engageo business and the demand-based business, um, they have very complementary capabilities. To me, I think the most important aspect or most notable is, is that data layer, where Engageo has always had a first-party data focus, where demand-based being the leader with you know, IP-based solutions for 
uh, personalization and targeting has had you know that kind of proprietary IP and third party data approach. So now um, coming together, you know, you have systems that are spanning both of those, those worlds with a vision to really enable the demand-based ABM platform that's powered by a B2B customer data platform. So um, then uh, those are the B2B commentary. So as far as COVID-19 impacts, a few studies I wanted to touch on. This study was done in May where uh, the question, how has COVID-19 impacted businesses? 40% uh, percent or so of people said they've reduced marketing and advertising spend and have stopped making large purchases, including software. Unfortunately, for this conversation, the number one category that they reduced software was marketing software. So where were they spending that money? Well, it's what we would term work from home software, web conferencing software, collaboration, collaboration tools, and remote desktop tools. That actually makes sense because if you, if you, you know, every time we were talking to companies, especially back in March and April, they were looking at the near term. What do I have to do right now to make sure my employees are productive working from home? So instead of looking for growth, they're looking, you know, very tactically, you know, for those aspects. But um, this recent report this month, um, I think is, is uh, you know, showing some optimism as far as, you know, where are we now and where are we going? So this question, when will ad spending restart or ramp up? 80% of respondents expect ad spend to restart or rebound by the end of Q3. Um, and then another data point uh, just today is, as many of you probably saw that uh, retail spend increased over 17% month to month in May which was the largest month-to-month -month increase uh, since 1992. So it does seem like we're kind of through that tactical, you know, phase of, of, you know, scrambling in March, April, and now back to looking at, at growth, which obviously is where marketing and advertising is focused. All right. So B2B marketing discussion, we're going to invite Penry Price um, onto the webinar. So um, I'm sure many of you know Penry, Penry is the Vice President of Marketing Solutions for LinkedIn, leading the go-to-market uh, for uh, that business. So welcome, Penry. Thanks, Brian. Great to see you. You too. Um, so first of all, I, I doubt many people need, the, uh, need this, but I thought we, want to, we should at least set the stage as far as what is LinkedIn Marketing Solutions? Um, you know, what are the offerings? You know, who do you sell to, et cetera? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's sort of the, I guess, current <clears throat> way of saying sort of advertising. It's the, it's LinkedIn's, you know, advertising business. Uh, we're talking to customers, companies all around the world, uh, from small startups to the largest uh, sort of enterprises, trying to figure out how to help them engage with uh, our members, uh, who is, we call our users, our members. And, and try to have productive conversations, try to sort of bring success to both sides of the marketplace uh, as we do lean more towards B2B uh, and more, I guess you could say high consideration B2C, but really more towards the B2B side. A lot of these people want to know each other. Companies want to deal with prospects. They want to talk to their uh, current prospects or uh, potential prospects. And, you know, our members or these prospects want to make smart buying decisions. So our, our job is to make sure those, those two meet well and have a productive uh, relationship. Excellent. And so you also have Sales Navigator. How does Sales Navigator relate to what you do and how the, the solutions interplay? Yeah, and, and as you said earlier in your talk, the trend certainly with uh, sales and marketing convergence, it's happening. Uh, we see it certainly uh, very clearly in the data. Um, however, We've historically, uh, we have two groups. So my group, again, uh, Marketing Solutions, talking to generally the CMO uh, and uh, the agencies that would support that CMO's team. And there's a sales solutions business that is in charge of talking to uh, really, you could imagine sort of VP of sales or sales operations leaders about what sales solutions offers, which their core product is Sales Navigator, which you could argue is sort of a similar um, software, piece of software that we have for recruiters that many people understand and know that LinkedIn is well known for. 
Uh, it's a sort of soft piece of software for sales professionals or business development professionals to really stay close to their prospects. And so it's run out of a separate team. Uh, we've done that for the reason actually that the buyers are different. And so even today where we talk about the convergence and these two channels or two teams working more closely together, especially in B2B, the buying decisions are historically and still today been made by different groups. And so we try to work with the customers that the way that they're set up. However, to your point, uh, these discussions are now intermingled much more than ever. And so the teams are working a little more closely together. We have relationships that now are broadening sort of across both groups, but the products are still separate. We're still working again separately to sort of um, make sure we're able to deliver to what that buyer is expecting. And uh, I would say over the future, though, this is probably an area of evolution as we sort of understand this convergence a little more clearly. Very good. Thank you. Um, so, so obviously you came from, from Google. Um, you were at Google, uh, it looked like seven years, and now you've been on LinkedIn about the same amount of time. And, and uh, as far as the B2C side, obviously Facebook and Google have been, you know, the, the duopoly now all Amazon adding to that with a triopoly, you know, with their wealth of first party data and specifically identify, you know, understanding who the people are. And uh, one of the big uh, um, assets that LinkedIn has are, li are logged in users, um, but very specific to business professionals. So can you talk a little bit about the size of, of that, um, you know, pool of individuals and then how you leverage uh, those identifiers. Yeah, I, you know, for from a scale perspective, we have about 690 million uh, members globally, about 170 million uh, now in the US. And for, for Terry's sake, we got about 17 million in Canada. So <laughs> follows the 10% rule with uh, the US and Canada. Um, Woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> growing, uh, growing very well uh, from a acquisition new member standpoint. I think there's still uh, a new member every few seconds. So certainly growth on the acquisition side of those members. The real challenge for the for us though is to have more of those members coming back. And so you know we're only from a monthly unique perspective, really ten to fifteen percent of that are people coming uh, on a monthly basis. And we're trying to build, and, and I hope you've seen and others have seen, uh, we've done a lot more uh, from an engagement standpoint, meaning more news, more curated news. It's not just about jobs, even though we've got millions of jobs available there. It's also about how do we make you a better professional? How do you learn about what's going on in your industry? Uh, we want you to be there more often. And so we've made a, a large investment on the content side on partnerships with content providers, as well as our own uh, news team, editorial team run by Dan Roth. And so it's all designed to try to get all those 690 million members to be back more often. How we use the data, uh, we've, had, uh, we've always had a member first sort of principle. And so we, we are very sort of clear about how we use data or the profile data really, that, that uh, identifier. And so we're using it for targeting purposes. We want to get you relevant jobs. So if you may be looking as an active job seeker or even a passive job seeker, we want to make sure we're getting you relevant job opportunities. Uh, for companies, we want to make sure you're able to target the right prospects. And so we're going to make sure that if you're looking for IT decision makers, we can actually gather those IT decision makers and, and make sure they're seeing the relevant confirmation or the relevant uh, information from you. And so we, we use that data really to make sure that we're offering the best service and creating the most value, both for the marketer in this case, as well as the member. Great. And I know me personally, I mean, I'm on LinkedIn all the time, but a lot of that has been driven by the changes that you've been, been making as far as the, the actual uh, you know, product team you know, with the notices, you know, who's been viewing your profile and, you know, what are your, con you know, your contacts that are in the news, et cetera, where um, we definitely, uh, me as a user, have seen the, uh, the efforts as far as making sure it's, it's not just a property to go look at profiles, but it's actually a, you know, content site as well that I find very, very valuable. So, so well done by that, that side of the business. Um, so as far as, the 
some of the changes that that we are seeing um, in the market, um, you know, things as far as like identifiers going away and uh, or having gone away and going away with like Google Chrome. How do you view that as far as affecting you, you know, from a positive perspective, negative perspective, you know, neutral, et cetera. But what are your views uh, there? You know, I think for all of us, for the whole industry, I would say it's a, it's a change and a pretty dramatic one, both from an identifier standpoint, as well as a measurement side. Uh, I, I would say for, for us, and it's been talked about the, the, if you have a relationship, a direct relationship with a user or member, uh, these changes will over time certainly be more beneficial to you versus if you don't have those relationships or those, uh, again, agreed upon value exchange where you've got that kind of profile, that kind of identifier. So for us, we feel it's um, uh, part of our evolution. We'll continue to grow here and we'll still uh, provide the value to those members. We feel it's our sort of, again, um, uh, really, it's on our sort of shoulders to do what's right here. We, we do it again in a member first way. So we do think we're going to see this as a benefit over time. But we want to also be cognizant of the changes, uh, as you said, on the cookie list future. What does that mean for things like conversion tracking and other retargeting models, things like that? Uh, this is sort of all the whole industry, again, going through changes. But for us, we're trying to figure out how to make sure we deliver on the value to the member that we, we uh, have always tried to think about. And that's been back to like relevant jobs. It's really important for members. Their experience on LinkedIn is not just about uh, that consumption of that content. They are actually trying to meet new businesses. They're trying to find business partners. They're trying to find suppliers. They're trying to find uh, employees. And so some of these identifiers, uh, again, for core at the profile level, are really important for us to use to make sure we're able to deliver that value. So we're, we're excited about it because we think we'll be stronger over time, but it's certainly changing the way we and our partners, either clients or agencies have been working uh, for three years. Excellent. And on the identifiers, I mentioned in my kind of opening comments, uh, comments, you have, you know, the spectrum from anonymous to, you know, completely known where they're opted in, logged in users. So, when I saw your acquisition of Drawbridge, um, I at first scratched my head. Um, I actually had to have you know you and others at LinkedIn describe it to me because I was like, wait, they, this is one of those unique companies that have the logged in individuals. Why do they need probabilistic uh, capabilities? So uh, I thought it was fascinating why you did that and what you're doing. So love to have you comment on you know why you did the, a- the acquisition and how you're using it. Yeah, I, you know, it goes to acquisitions and probably, uh, you, you know, John can talk about this. It starts with a founder. Uh, so we, Kamakshi is a rock star and uh, somebody I'd known for a long time. We got very interested in what they've been doing on the sort of cross device identifier and identity work. Um, as I was mentioning, unfortunately, LinkedIn, we don't have people there, you know, all the time, every day. And so we do have this amazing logged in profile and identity uh, when you're on LinkedIn. But certainly, again, many of our uh, members are, you know, on other sites on other parts of the web doing other apps, whatever it might be. And so for us as to thinking about how we grow and how do we provide a service where we're again, mostly B2B, and you understand that sort of the customer journey for B2B is many touch points before you get some kind of conversion. And so, you know, some say seven to eight, some even say more than that. And so if we lost sight or when we lose sight of those uh, members, uh, when they go off platform, uh, it's harder for us to reconcile from a conversion standpoint or understand the journey of that potential member or conversion to that brand or customer of ours. And so uh, Drawbridge had done a lot of interesting work on their own sort of identity graph <clears throat> and when we sort of thought about this, this was a way for us to really sort of shore up our own ability to understand and really measure performance for customers about our ability to, uh, again, make sure we're delivering the right message to that right customer or potential customer back for that, for that uh, client. So that was really the impetus behind the, uh, the acquisition at that time. Great. And how has it gone? 
Yeah, it's gone great. I mean, it's uh, like we all say on these things, right? You guys know that. No one ever mm-hmm. says these are bad ideas. <laughs> but it's, uh, it's, gone, it's gone exceedingly well. Kamakshi is still a rock star, as is the entire team if we've gotten to know them. Uh, we've integrated uh, the drawbridge technology now into our core platform. And so we are now seeing finally sort of our measurement offerings and our ability to think about targeting a little differently um, is now sort of being sort of brought to bear. Actually, like within, I want to say within two or three weeks, uh, in the last few weeks, we've now fully ramped that technology. And so we're starting to have customers see the benefits of actually really understanding the performance of these campaigns because we can now understand more broadly what's happening to those members when they engage with uh, their messaging. Great. So love to hear from you. I, you know, I talked a little bit about some of our observations on the market and trends we, we see. So as far as you personally, what are areas that, that you're really excited about at LinkedIn? Uh, there, there are probably three. There's like two and a half, I would say. One, one you mentioned, which I certainly agree with you on, is just this sort of notion of lead management and sort of a broader sense of lead scoring and lead targeting, all these sort of areas to me are incredibly uh, interesting for us as a platform. We have a lot of data beyond just our marketing data that we use or the profile data. We've got that sales data we mentioned. We have understanding of profiles engaging on talent side of uh, the business. And so we actually have a really robust set of data we can use when we think about leads across lots of different objectives for a company. So overall lead management is something I think you certainly touched on as important. We see that as growing in in importance and and frankly harder to do when you think about cross device and losing cookies and other identifiers. We think this is something that we will do very well. Uh, The second one uh, is virtual events. Uh, If you think about B2B marketers uh, and you touched on it with some of your, your data, a lot of people have moved budget and, and sort of really attention to how do I actually do virtual events well. And uh, B2B, historically, a lot of spend between 30 and 45% of their spend annually is to do events. And so the fact now that, you know, we, no one knows the future, there certainly will be physical events at some point. But I think because of what's happened and all of us doing things like this, to engage with our uh, existing communities or customers and build new ones, uh, there's gonna be a lot of uh, new effort around virtual events. And so we think again, uh, LinkedIn as a platform can do a lot in the virtual event space. So that's something I'm excited about. And the last one, sort of half and half, I'm excited, but also uh, a little bit thinking of as a red herring here, which is ABM, which is you, you brought up as a huge trend in the marketplace, which certainly is uh, understandable. And so I'm a very big believer in, in ABM as a tactic, but on the sort of flip side of it, I, I also make sure that when we talk to our customers about ABM, we talk about the fact that, you know, it, it's, you've got to find growth outside of the companies that you already know or work with. And so building in some, again, data science and predictive models to actually go beyond the companies that you already are engaging with, or already understand or know, is an important growth opportunity for companies. And so we're trying to balance the ABM's sort of tactics that we deploy and work with, with our ability hopefully to find companies that look like or act like those companies so we can help find new growth to bring into the top of the funnel for our companies we work with. Excellent. All right, I wanna shift gears a little bit and just talk about you as as a a leader, you know, with a team. Um, Obviously we all, you know, shifted to, you know, working, working from home. Um, what, did, what did you experience both on, you know, what you had to do with your team to make sure they were working effectively, as well as, you know, what you saw from the customer side? You know, what were customers telling you? What are they, you know, kind of back in March, April, and what are they telling you now? Uh, yeah, so start with the customer side. I think the, you know, we, we all, it was, uh, you know, we braced for impact. I think all of us, nobody knew what was going to happen. It, it came so suddenly. Uh, we had to sort of rethink about our, all of our conversations with customers. Most of them were frozen. Most of the customers really didn't know what was going, frankly, day to day. And certainly many of them paused. 
And so what we did with customers was we moved towards a sort of engagement around just preparing them and giving them as much data and insight as we had around the platform. And so one example was in, in uh, January of this year, which seems like you know years ago at this point, January, about 35% of the sort of posts on LinkedIn were related to things like gathering information or ideas around business. And two months later in March, 35% of the, you know, sort of commentary comments posts were about COVID. And so, you know, that is a massive change at the scale we operate with at to sort of think about, okay, how do I advise a customer of how to take advantage of this or how should they show up or what type of content, what type of engagement should they expect? So we did a lot of work on that side with our customers and just supported them through their own cycle of pausing and then coming back, uh, as also you said in your notes, you know, a lot of people have come back now. We've seen that sort of, uh, sort of rebound, but it was a, a lot of work to get people prepared and confident enough to go to their CEO or whoever it was to sort of feel confident to start to open spend again. And so a lot of uh, work on that behalf. On my team. Yeah, interesting on, on sorry to interrupt, on, on yeah. our side, since our business is M&A advisory, similar dynamics. I mean, we, uh, you know, 2020 was looking like, you know, the best year ever, you know, we closed, you know, three deals in the first three months and, and actively negotiating uh, deals in March that all of a sudden stopped. Um, and it went from, you know, you know, leaders like yourself that when you're looking at growing your business, I mean, you're looking out in kind of a, you know, two to five year horizon. What do I need to do not to grow and meet this year's plan, but meet you know, those two to five year plan and M&A obviously becomes part of that where all of a sudden, you know, the leaders just, they, they couldn't look that far out. They had to look immediately like the next two months and make sure that, that their business was operating effectively, making sure their employees were working productively, touching their customers, reviewing their pipelines, et cetera. Um, but what's, and, and I personally thought that, you know, M and A was going to be stalled out for for a while, but in June, you know the the deals we were actively working on largely have come back um, and have started you know to show life again. So even on the M and A side, it's been interesting to see how how pretty how quickly uh, companies have gone from kind of the tactics of you know what we need to do now to now looking at growth again. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it's incredible and, and, and hopefully, again, for all of our sake that <clears throat> this continues, not just from a business perspective, but from a health perspective and everything else that we don't have anything that turns sideways. Um, yeah, actually, it's funny you mentioned sort of the way you thought of it or the way you saw it from this timeline compression for your teams you were working with or customers you're working with. That was the way, <coughs> excuse me, I showed up or tried to show up to my team, which was, Throw out your quarterly plans, throw out your annual plans. You know, we are now in a dogfight for a day-to-day -day sort of management of a business and a relationship with the customers and yourselves and your teams. Um, you know, a team uh, that's measured on a quarterly or annual sort of goal, uh, you know, you worry, frankly, about mental health and all sorts of other things when you know that you, there's no possible way to get there. And so you start to sort of consider, you know, gosh, I'm not going to get there. So let's think of other behaviors or, or what, am I, what else? I, maybe I'll just phone it in for a little while. And so I think the job of a leader during this time or any time where you have this sort of downturn is to compress time horizons, compress goals. And so we started to actually have daily and weekly goals for the team. And it wasn't about revenue. It was about, you know, how, how many people called you back this week? Like that yeah. is in itself is a sign of progress. If it was more right. this week than last week, how many campaigns started this week versus last week? And if it was three and now it's seven, you're starting to win again. And so it was sort of recalibrating everybody's mind to sort of get away from this longer cycle, exactly your point, and find new metrics to track on a daily or weekly basis that you could actually believe that you're making progress, which again, attributes a lot back to mental health and being able to relax and being able to balance your life at home. And there's a lot of things 
that actually were able to ha- were started to happen because we actually recalibrated everybody. So that was my my team learning is spending a lot more time in a micro uh, sort of measurement environment and allowing teams to think about winning in the short term versus the normal sort of normal cadence of business measurement. Right. Well, I know we can talk for a lot longer, but we do have a limited amount of time. So uh, appreciate uh, you being on this and your, your comments. And we are going to shift over to the conversation with, uh, with Gabe and John. So thanks so much, Henry. Thanks, Brian. Appreciate it. All right. Take care. All right. I see Gabe. Hey, Brian. Hello. And there's John. All right. Um, so first of all, congratulations that you are both on this together. Um, and congratulations on getting a deal done in this environment. It is challenging. That's for sure. Um, yes, it is. And, and then just, you know, the deal. So congratulations on all the above. Um, I know, again, like Penry, most people, you know, are familiar with Penry and LinkedIn marketing solutions, probably the same thing with demand base and Engageo. But um, I, I think, I think Gabe, you mentioned um, at one point is sometimes people think that we're competitive. Um, so let's make sure that people understand, you know, what demand bases business has been um, and currently is today and Engageo, same thing. Um, so Gabe, if you could give just an introduction of demand base and yourself, and then John, same thing with Engageo. So this kind of set the stage for both of you as independent companies. Yep. Yeah. Thanks, Brian. And thanks for uh, setting up this webinar so close to our announcement, <laughs> although I know you do them weekly. So appreciate that. Uh, yeah. I mean, demand base's mission is really to transform the way B2B companies go to market. And that's, that's about a major business transformation that's happening within B2B. And you can think of it as kind of moving from one model to another. So the model that we've been in, in large part, John was very responsible for uh, creating, which is kind of the marketing automation model. So that's the kind of, we think of it as the baton pass model. So it's like a linear buyer's journey where marketing, you know, kind of does stuff, creates inbound leads, and then hands them off to sales. And, uh, you know, that's all been blown up with the way the customer journey has become much more complex. And we need this new model that we've been advocating for a long time at Demandbase and really what ABM is all about, which is this choreographed model, or as John says, instead of the baton pass, it's really the soccer team with sales and marketing as the players moving in in unison. And, uh, you know, we've been dedicated to that. I've been at Demandbase for eight years. I stepped into the CEO role at the end of last year. Great time to step in as CEO. (laughs) No surprises whatsoever. Um, But what Demandbase has been, you know, to your question, known for, you know, prior to to the companies coming together in this exciting way is really, uh, you know, kind of top and mid funnel uh, ABM activities to facilitate that that transformation. And, And specifically, that's about understanding the accounts most likely to buy. So kind of to Penry's point, ABM, not just about your current customer base, it's also who are the new accounts most likely to buy. So we have that proprietary intent data to go find those accounts. From there, using proprietary ad technology to get the accounts and the people most interested in those accounts and your products to your site. Once they're on your site, personalizing content and then alerting the sales team uh, so that they can close the the revenue loop. Uh, so that, that's what we've done up till now. But now with John and the combination of Engageo and kind of those boxes that you showed, we really will have the definitive ABM platform from like top of funnel to bottom of funnel. So I'll let, uh, I guess, if, if we want John to do the same thing, but that's kind of where we have been with demand base. Yep. Great. Yep, John. Yeah, so I mean, uh, at Engageo, you know, I really start, built a platform that relied on my marketing automation heritage. And, you know, so for us, you know, our system, you know, we really almost think about it as a account-based engagement platform, you know, uh, and and, in some ways very similar to the CDP stack you guys showed earlier. So we started with the data, the first party data, you know, so just like Marketo syncs to your Salesforce at Engageo, we sync to your Salesforce and your Marketo 
and your Exchange or your Gmail. So just really collect all that really awesome first party information. And then we match it up at the account. So that way you kind of have that comprehensive view of both the account and the person. That's the guts of our system. You know, on top of that, we built an orchestration engine that is, you know, kind of like marketing automation, but it really works at both the people level and the account level. Uh, and then we then built a, the ability to execute those plays that you design, you know, across third party channels. So an, an integration into LinkedIn marketing solutions, for example, uh, integration into sales engagement tools like Outreach and Sales Loft, as well as, you know, other systems like market automation, CRM, direct mail, you know, and so on. I think where the, the probably the most compelling part of the Engageo solution, though, is in how we really help marketing and sales teams work as a team, kind of at every stage of the count journey, by getting them to look at the same data and orchestrate the interactions. So, you know, in some ways, demand base was really awesome at digital ABM. And Engageo is really awesome at kind of uh, human ABM, sales and marketing teams working together. You know, demand base is really awesome at the accounts you don't know, the third party data that's not in your database. Engageo awesome at the accounts you do know, the ones that are actually in your system, the first party data. And that's just part of the reason why these jigsaw pieces fit together so perfectly. And, and uh, I think you've already stated it with the, comment, with the commentary you already made, and I stole your thunder a little bit. But um, maybe Gabe, as, as you know, CEO of Demandbase, can you talk about um, you know, how the deal got going and then the aha, hey, we should come together, you know, the strategic rationale for, for doing the deal? Yeah. Well, um, you know, kind of when I was coming on board as, as CEO at the end of last year, as I mentioned, you know, it's a natural time to evaluate the business, think about the market. And so we, we had done a lot of kind of soul searching of like, what does the next three years look like for demand base strategically? And one of the things that was very prominent was just thinking about that B2B transformation that we were talking about. And then within that, ABM as, as kind of the major driving category to facilitate it. And what we kept believing or, or seeing is that ABM was real and still is in this very interesting place where the level of awareness is super high. Every B2B company, I believe now, you know, at the executive level, it understands that they need an ABM strategy on the one hand, but there's this kind of paradoxical, you know, conflating trend, which is that there's confusion around what ABM actually is. And that's because it can be a technique and, it, you know, if you might get into this, it can be a technology. So there was this real need for clarifying and defining what ABM actually is. And that's what led to that slide that you presented. It's like, this is what it is. It's a data layer with first and third party data. It's a decision layer that enables you to create kind of the, the, the fundamental unit of B2B revenue, which is the account, audience, the account and the account audience and then enables you to act through channels. And we were really ruthless in looking at ourselves and saying, look, here's what we do well, um, ads, intense, um, uh, analytics, um, personalization. Here's what we don't do well, first party, um, going deep into sales and orchestration. And therefore, you know, we understood what, what would complete the picture. That was what our roadmap would be. John and I have known each other for a long time. You know, we've been partner companies, actually not competitors. And we met and uh, they just kind of magic happened where we both had this same exact vision. And we had realized that like we had done the inverse pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. So I don't know, John, I'll let you take it up from there. But um, it, was, it was kind of one of those fortuitous uh, events that just kind of happens. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we probably hit the highlight already, right? <clears throat> you know, which is, uh, I can't think of any other example I've seen in my career where you had two companies that are ostensibly in the same category, that ostensibly, you know, analysts would put on the same chart as, you know, kind of players, you know, doing the, you know, that when you actually look under the hood, had so little actual overlap in terms of the functionality and such a complete coverage 
of the unified set of functionality. You know, it's, it's almost eerie, uh, as if we had planned it or something. Uh, but, but, you know, and, and that's why this deal happened. Yeah. You know, um, we can get into kind of COVID and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, the, the high level point is, you know, financially, Engageo did not need to do this deal. You know, if anything, COVID made uh, this deal harder for demand base to do just because, you know, oh my gosh, you're going to do what? <laughs> you know, in, in the middle of a crisis. It was how the reason this deal happened is because Gabe and I both saw how perfectly this combination would create the best product in the marketplace. And I think once we linked arms on that shared vision, there, you know, we weren't going to let anything, including COVID, get in the way of the deal kind of coming to fruition. Great. Let's get a little more granular. So, John, you're going to be leading product going forward, correct? That's correct. So, love to hear from a, you know, not from a high-level strategy perspective, but from a product perspective. You know, how, how are these platforms, technologies, you know, going to come together? Yeah. Well, one of the other, again, kind of happy coincidences that makes this, all of this work is that if you look at the demand-based technology stack, I almost like to think about it as like the iceberg, you know, to use an overused metaphor, but, but, but there is very little actual user interface in the demand-based application. And there's just this massive mountain of technology, whether it's machine learning or data or, you know, the only DSP focused on B2B accounts, uh, you know, and so on. Engageo is very much a business application that has tons of user interface, tons of kind of front end process and workflow, you know, and things like that. And so the integration is, you know, very much almost like starting with the Engageo user interface. Will be, that will be the interface kind of going forward. Uh, of the combined application, and then we'll be bringing in all this amazing demand-based technology, uh, you know, to, to power, you know, frankly, holes that might have been in the Engageo platform. Uh, and so it's an ambitious integration, but it's also one that we believe we can accomplish in its total totality this year because of how well the two pieces actually fit. Excellent. Um wanted to, to go back to some of the conversation I had with Henry um, and then some of my opening comments. Um, and this probably gave, you know, more address to uh, you where, you know, we, you know, we're seeing all these dynamics around, you know, data, data restrictions, privacy, et cetera. Um, it seemed to actually, um, you know, could accrue to your benefits, your benefit as far as um, some of your capabilities around IP based targeting and advertising, and then your contextual solution. Love to hear your views on, on uh, market dynamics and your solutions and how they interplay. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, well, I kind of think of it in, in two big buckets. There's you know, the privacy regulation and then the technology change that came from it. Mm -hmm. you know, I think you know, the, the privacy regulation, the impact of that was really felt in 2019 you know, with GDPR. And the whole, I think there was a lot of confusion uh, in, in some sense, the same as, as COVID with, without obviously the, the horrible kind of health side of things, but in terms of how are we going to do business? And, um, you know, it took a, a certain period of time, but I think, you know, the, the markets came to a consensus. So it's okay. It's, a, it's about consent and, and, and who's warranting that they have consent. So I think the actual, like, contracting and doing business on the privacy side of things has actually become quite clear. Then it's like, okay, how are companies being technology forward? First and foremost, Google and the decisions they're making and, and the third party um, decision, as Penry mentioned, like that, that's, that's much, almost much larger than regulation because it's changing the very way you can, you can reach users. And, and I agree with him that, there's still a lot to be determined, but, but very much, you know, I, what we can say is that demand base is, it happens to be in a very good position because we've never really been focused on the person. And we've always been kind of focused on doing it without cookies because we have the most powerful B2B IP to company uh, data set available. And that's kind of what we built the business on and that what we were, have been known for through the years. So we really, you know, are, 
pressing to have a solution for B2B advertisers, you know, within the matter of, of, of weeks, really, where you can combine our IP identification to make sure you're re- reaching that fundamental kind of business uh, marketing unit of revenue, which is the account, and then reach people within that account that are most likely to buy through one of the trends you mentioned, which is contextual targeting and using yeah. our machine learning that John mentioned and uh, kind of leveraging our acquisition of Spiderbook four years ago, which was all about it kind of doubling down on machine learning to understand what's happening across the internet, to understand what's happening on every page, to kind of create a hierarchy of topics and then be able to kind of laser focus ads to the company, to the people that are reading the right content to buy your products. So mm-hmm. that will be a solution that solves kind of some of the uh, identity problem. You know, at a high level, you know, I think there's there's pros and cons to, to, to the third party cookies going away. It's going to be difficult, as Penry mentioned, to measure like we did before. Retargeting becomes much more difficult. However, I do think the industry was getting lazy in using kind of third party cookies as a primary identity source because, you know, it, it's very much a supply chain, unknown supply chain of publishers that are kind of producing that identity. So I, I think in addition to having new solutions like demand base, you know, we're going to rely on the signal we do have, which could first party data, as you mentioned, yeah. like users at LinkedIn, that sort of thing might not be as much single signal, but it'll be a clearer signal than some of the third party data that marketers had been using. Yeah, curious. So Penry, when he was talking about LinkedIn marketing solutions and then LinkedIn sales solutions with Sales Navigator, you mentioned, you know, since you have kind of the, the classic funnel, you know, advertising, the basically advertising marketing to sales. And, and one of the key reasons why they're actually separate organizations in LinkedIn is because there's different buyer groups for advertising and sales. So Demandbase has been one of those companies that has had the combination of advertising and marketing together. And curious about, you know, how you've approached that, where those are, uh, there's a tighter linkage between advertising and marketing. And um, do you have also different buyers for your solutions or do you have one buyer and therefore how do you go about selling those marketing and advertising solutions and how do you price them, et cetera? Yeah. Um, well, the, the kind of the, the, who the buyer is depends on the segment, you know, within mid market companies, you know, uh, cause we sell to all sorts of type companies like LinkedIn does, um, you know, have a spectrum of customers you know, there's a tighter buying group, you know, so it's a cluster of, of marketers that pretty much does everything, you know, have to, wears multiple hats. And so can, in some ways, it's easier for them to integrate the full range of demand based capabilities. And then, you know, within enterprise, there's, there's many different, um, you know, personas that, that we work with, and even more now that we're, uh, you know, we're combined with Engageo the full spectrum of kind of sales and marketing personas. So it really depends on what, what's the tip of the spear and where do we start um, to your broader point about sales and, and or, or marketing and ad tech combining, I think it's very important. You know, as you mentioned, it, it kind of happened to a degree within B2C at the, at the DMP level. I think it's even more important in B2B because there's no current, account-based system of record. And, and in essence, that we're, that's what we're driving to is how do you have the, the complete 360 view of the account? And that requires understanding what's happening off-site and on your site. That requires being able to target off-site and on your site. That requires being able to deliver the right message off-site and on your site, measuring off-site and on your site. So really what that means is it requires being able to do advertising and be able to work with the marketing stack. So I just think it's so important that, uh, you know, within B2B companies like Demandbase kind of keep driving the convergence. The last point uh, around pricing, you know, we, we have kind of a hybrid model. There's a technology license for all of the audience management stuff, the campaign management, the measurement, and then there's more of a usage model around how much advertising, you, you know, you want to do and you can kind of go up and down based on, on CPMs. Great. And I assume the vast majority of your customers for advertising 
is direct to the actual enterprise rather than through agencies, correct? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a whole other interesting dynamic. There's certainly some, some big agencies, uh, you know, the whole, you know, DWA, Merkle combination, you know, we work very closely with o Ogilvy Common Health um, for the healthcare segment, very close partner. But in general, because, you know, the, you, we're integrating so many capabilities and we want to kind of have an effective strategy, most of the relationships are direct, yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Since we, we definitely have seen on the B to C um, you know, DSP side, some of them have experimented with, hey, can we do uh, kind of SaaS-based pricing or at least the technology fee? And since so much of, of, uh, of the agency world is pass-through pricing, it just never worked. But obviously, when you're going direct to the customer, you can have that kind of hybrid technology fee plus variable fee. So uh, that's interesting. Um, so looks like we have just a few more minutes left. Um, wanted to switch to, you know, kind of last topic that um, addressed with Penry is, you know, what have you seen from, you know, your customers in the market, um, you know, and, and love to hear kind of what you saw in like the March, early April timeframe versus what you're seeing now. Um, you know, definitely we're spending a lot of time with a lot of companies and, and uh, you know, love to hear your view on, on uh, how basically the market environment's looking now. Yeah, I, I, could, I could start. I mean, I, there was a very pronounced, clear trend, uh, positive trend um, for our business, uh, you know, in the early days of, of COVID, uh, particularly around the, the, our ad targeting and being able to, you know, target accounts in such an effective way, you know, as a result of not being able to do face-to-face -face events with customers. So, you know, in kind of that first couple months after um, everybody realized that, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to, to, to meet up, all of the field budgets and, and event budgets, um, you know, especially in large enterprises, they don't just kind of go away, they're, they're kind of there, <laughs> you know? And so there was this kind of mad rush to say, okay, how are we still reaching our customers. So we saw this tremendous spike in our, in our ad business. I think, you know, that was, uh, that was a bit of a short-term phenomena in that there was this, then there was this phase of kind of a, a reset of like, well, now let's just be cautious in general um, and kind of tamp down our budgets. So it kind of returned to, you know, a little bit below normal, I would say, but still, still pretty robust. And, and now I think people, you know, where it's kind of shaking out in my mind is, there's just, there is a mindset of like, we got to do things differently. You know, we got to do things. There was already this, of course, huge push to digital. And I just, I, I see that even accelerated. So being able to understand your data in all the ways we've talked about and action on it in real time at scale is how you get B2B customers. And so, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of openness to business transformation. And I, I think now is the time that we move from that last linear customer journey model that we talked about to a more effective B2B strategy, which uh, works with, with a much more complicated customer journey, which is all these people digitally, you know, kind of moving through different funnels. So uh, I, I think we've it, it facilitated the business transformation we had already kind of seen happening. And last question, I'm curious as a you know M and A advisor. So since a lot of M and A is accomplished through in person meetings, you know all the you know diligence meetings, uh, you know planning meetings, etc. How how did you find you know doing a, a deal essentially remote? You know what were some of the learnings, the experiences, and learnings there on both sides of the equation? I'll start. You know, just you know, don't do it unless you. <laughs> <laughs> are just so fundamentally, you know, driven for, by the compelling reasons to get it done. I mean, it, it was hard. You know, there's no doubt about it. And, and it just only happened because Gabe and I forced it to happen uh, to, to, to create this incredible combination. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the key. It's the trust you have with the people you're working with. And, um, you know, I think John and I spent maybe five or six months together. You know, it feels feels like we've known each other for decades <laughs> coming through that experience because, you know, there was this huge 
you know, we have, we have a great board, both, both sides that are invested in our success. They're open to possibilities, but it's just, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to do this? So it, it requires, you know, probably an even higher level of commitment to the, the value that you're going to deliver and great trust in your partner in, in working through it. Great. Well, we are at the top of the hour. So really appreciate both of you coming on again, congrats on the combination. And I know you're going to have a busy time ahead and, and uh, you know, lots, lots of uh, uh, excitement, you know, coming together. So yeah, we thanks appreciate again. it. It was great talking with you, Brian. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Bye. And uh, Terry, I didn't know if you're, there you go. Yeah. Still here. Uh, fascinating conversation. Uh, B2B software, lots of facets of it. It's, uh, I think, uh, one of the most exciting uh, aspects of uh, media and uh, uh, marketing and, and advertising. That concludes our B2B software uh, webinar. And that concludes season two of Luma's Work From Home webinar series and the entire series. So uh, we have tremendously enjoyed uh, the dialogue, the conversation, not only live on the webinar, but also lots of the follow-up that we've had afterwards with many of you, the thousands and thousands of people who have uh, viewed our series over the course of the last three months. Um, and so while, again, while we're sunsetting this particular format of work from home webinar, uh, stay tuned uh, for more content, uh, utilizing the fact that we have these great facile technologies to be able to communicate with uh, so many people. We're going to shift it, as mentioned, to a more of a conversation format and less webinar. Um, so stay tuned for additional virtual CAN conversations and then what will come following that. So uh, on behalf of Luma, uh, this is Terry Kawaja signing off for Luma's Work From Home webinar series. Thank you all for joining.